Habakkuk said, the mountains can fall into the sea. It doesn't matter what happens, amen? open your Bible again tonight to the third chapter of the book of Revelation and try to conclude this part about the money part of the gospel of covenant. Let me just say something to you. This way that we're talking about is called the way of salvation and the Lord is the architect and the designer of it. Can you say amen? Amen. Because a lot of things we're going to find that our flesh is not going to like and this I can tell you right now amen. is primarily number one in most of it. The money aspect. Because man is born with the spirit of greed and covetousness. The Bible says very clearly he's of the Canaanite spirit, which means of lust and greed and what's in it for me, and don't give God any part of it. Amen? Spirit of selfishness. But in the third chapter of Revelation, I'm going to set you up for probably four weeks in advance. I'm talking about what it means to be naked before God. And every time we're praising the Lord, I want you to know that in this praise service that just took place, that was the mighty angel of God taking inventory of what he read from the incense that went up. When we speak to the Lord, everything that's going on in our life that's contrary to the scriptures is being read in the annals of heaven. Or listen to me. In the third chapter of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church. And I want you to know that in these seven churches are different attributes that's found in all the churches. And so in the seventh church, he talks about a people in a place of security. When there is no security. They're in a place where they feel comfortable. Where there is no time to be comfortable. And this is their testimony. Verse 17. Because you say I am rich. Somebody read out loud verse 15. Stop right there. What does he know? See he's looking at the deeds. The doing part. And don't forget this. The doing part is always the keeping of the covenant. He says again, here's your testimony. You say, I am rich. You say, I have become wealthy. You say, I have need of nothing. He says, and you don't know, you don't know that you are wretched, that you are miserable, that you are poor, and that you are blind. And that you are naked. And what does Jesus say in the 15th verse? I know your deeds. What does he know? I know your deeds. It's important we, know, we learn this doing part. Amen? <clears throat> he continues. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. The gold is Christ's nature. That you may become rich. And white garments. That you may clothe yourself. Don't miss that. That you may clothe yourself. A clothing part is done by us in keeping the covenant. That you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness, is that in your Bible? May not be revealed. He is saying, I'm speaking to you about the words of covenant. That you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed because it will be revealed for all eternity. And I shall to anoint your eyes that you may see. Jesus said, if they see in return, I will heal them quickly. Amen? And so he says to us that I'm speaking this to you in the attitude of love. Jesus says, those whom I love, the ones I love. We talked before about the silent judgment of God. You know people, and I know people, who claim to be Christians that seem like they get away with murder and nothing ever seems to happen to them. David talked about it also. In fact, David said it almost made him backslide. He said, my foot almost slipped. When I looked and considered the wicked, the evil, but the ones that the Lord loves, he says, I reprove them, I discipline them, and here's the reason. He says, be zealous therefore, which means, hook yourself into a fiery chariot. Be quick to repent. A man of zeal, you can't stop it. He says, be zealous therefore. And do what? Repent. And repent. Why is he saying to repent? 
He is speaking about the authority of his word when it comes to our ears, the ears of the heart. <coughs> he said, it's me standing at the door and I'm knocking. This is not a salvation scripture. This is a repentance scripture. This is a returning to God scripture. This is a returning to keeping covenant scripture. Even though we as preachers have used this many times for altar calls. This was not written to the sinner. This was written to those who claim they are in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And their works of obedience have not been found complete before the Lamb of God. He who has eyes of fire is saying, I'm telling you what you're facing. He says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, you open the door by obedience. You accept God's way over your way. Jesus says, I will come into him. Come into him. I thought he already came in. I will come into him. I will dine with him and he with me, which means we will walk in covenant. Dining with you and you with him means covenant keeping. But he says, to him who overcomes, which means overcomes these acts of rebellion and disobedience, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. But wait a minute. I thought Ephesians said very clearly that when we got saved, that we were raised up with him and we were made to sit with him in heavenly places. You're right. But what we're reading about is a church that's lost their seat. As I overcame, and sat down with my father on his throne. He that has an ear, that means an ear for God. A heart that yields toward God. Let me hear what the Spirit says to the church. This is a message to the church. Not a message to the backslider. Or those that straddle the fence. This message is designed for only the, that part of the remnant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are saying, Lord, if I just know what your laws are, I will obey them. Reveal them to me. That's what this message is for. Let's go back to look at the 16th chapter because I want to seed you with the word of God concerning nakedness and uncleanliness and spots and wrinkles and blemishes and begin to show you part of what the linen is all about. That's described in the priest garment. And the Bible says in the first chapter of Revelation, verse 5 and 6, that is through his blood, which is the blood of the covenant, we have been made kings and priests. Made. We have been made kings and priests. In Luke chapter 16, we saw this this morning, but let's look at it again. We're talking about the tithe and the money part of obedience. Jesus calls it filthy lucre. But let's see what the right place of money is. And I can tell you this right now, I forgot that letter. I think it's in my briefcase. One of the brothers gave me a letter today. Um, um, Mark, look at my briefcase. You said that form... And on there is this thing about blessings and, 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 and blessing crosses and words like prosperity. And the preacher doesn't even sign his name. I mean, he signs it. And, and I mean, this, this to me is, is the height and the epitome of, uh, of evil. This man uses a signature where you don't even know you're sending your money to anymore. And the whole thing is about a, a money scheme. Or oh, listen to me. But there is a rightful place for our money in the, in, the, in the house of the Lord. Amen? So he says very clearly, this is Jesus speaking. He says in the 11th verse, 10th verse, he who, was un, who, he who was faithful, that means the one that is called to walk in covenant, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he's talking about money. He's talking about being faithful with your money. The Lord is saying to us, you can always judge the yardstick of how they react in the churches with their tithes and their offerings. And you can determine by this law that the Lord just spoke to us whether they are, uh, are faithful in the other things of God or not. Now this is the word of God I'm reading to you. Not my opinion. Amen? He says, he who is faithful in a very little thing that's covenant is faithful also in much. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing, he's talking about the keeping of the covenant of the tithes and the offerings. Let me try something else. I know I'm going to get to my notes tonight, so I'm going to follow what Lord gave me at 7 o'clock in the morning and just change the message. Here it is. Thank the Lord. You're much wiser than I am. You might want to just pass this around and look at this, this dumb from hell. 
I wouldn't use a stronger word, but somehow I got virgin ears. And show me what the tell us, somebody tell this man's name and just pass it around. But make sure it all, it, it all ends back up to my full bed, if you would please. Very little thing. He called the tithing and the and the obese, the tithing offering one of the smallest things of God's covenant. The Bible says that man, you can look at his life. Who will entrust the true riches to you? And let me just say this for those that receive what they'll be going to be breakage in the tape and break it to the videotape, so just bear with us, because you'll get the essence of what I'm saying. Amen? Amen. This is what he goes on to say here. He says, if therefore you have not been faithful. Now, folks, he's talking about the smallest thing of God's law, the tithe and the offering. And let me just say it again for the record. All our bills are paid. There is not a radio station that we owe anything to. Oh, listen to me. Tell me. And our radio expenses is $118,000 a year. And it's all paid. This is what he goes on to say. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, he's talking here about God's part. Who will entrust the true riches to you? Now folks, the riches we are after is not of this life and it's not of this world. I am sorry if you bought the lie that God wants you rich. I'm sorry but you bought a lie. I'm sorry about the lie that God wants you to wear the best. Because when they're only wearing the best, make sure you get in God his part. Or this thing yeah, I'm sorry you bought that lie. But we'll respond more to that lie than we will those, our simple obedience, like the tithing and the offering. And so he continues. He says to us that that 10% in our pockets that we keep sometimes don't even belong to us. He says in verse 12, if you have not been faithful, in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? What belongs to us? When you walk, begin to walk with God, let me tell you something. Everything that's in God's character becomes yours by the right and the law of covenant. Everything. Power over hell. Power to raise the dead. Power to cast out demons. Power to be holy. Righteous. Became mine. But just because this one stumbling block of a tithe and offering is not manifested in my life. It's not manifested in your life. I was sharing with a brother this evening. You know, a lot of times we get people out of town and um, we supply all their food and their meals. And I was saying to him, I want to make sure that I am so honest in the tithe and offering from now on, whatever this church pays to pay for their expenses, we're going to pay tithes and offerings on that also. Mm. Well, listen to me. Because we want to be sure that there's lots of abundant grace being oh, supplied yeah. to us. Are you listening to me? And so he goes on to say, no, no servant can serve two masters. He calls money a master, which means it's a master of a man's soul. And it has a greater uh, intense place in the heart than just serving and obeying God does. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and he'll love the other, that those just love money and they use that as an excuse. They come with every excuse in the book to keep from obeying this part of God's law. Or else he will hold the one and God says they're despising the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. Is that also in your Bible? Yeah. And so he's talking here, just like we just got to read in the third chapter of Revelation. He's talking to the church of that day. These people are reading about were the most righteous looking and acting people on the face of the earth. The Pharisees were the biggies. They were of more, much more righteousness and more, more intensity than the Sadducees and the Zealots than the Herodians of that day. Are you listening to me? And so Jesus is speaking to number one, number uno of religions of that day. It'd be like the Lord Jesus Christ coming down and speaking to us who claim that we're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and that we're fine. Be about the same way. Think of the ones who brag about their power. Think of the ones who brag about their gifts. Think of the ones who brag about they can speak in tongues. It'd be the same way. As it comes to them. And the Bible begins to show us the true heart intention of these people. Is there any one of the prosperity message? Is the number one message today among Pentecostal charismatic circles? Of course not. Why? Because it's part of the degenerate nature of man. He loves money. And so it says here the Pharisees 
who were lovers of money, they were listening to him. And while they were listening, he says, and they were scoffing at him. Is it also in your Bible? And then Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. You know how you justify yourself? You give excuse why you can find a way to not obey God. And you say, I'm right in not obeying this part of God. I'm, I'm right. I don't do it because of this or that reason. He said, you are those. You are those who justify yourself in the sight of men. And, and he says, but you can't fool God because God's looking at what? He's watching the heart. He's looking at your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. And it goes on and said this attitude is so prevalent of in his day. And let me say, Lord, it's returned in our day. He said, they are sitting among you in your midst. You see, I can't get to Jude right now about the spots and the blemishes in your love feast. He says, the law and the prophets, which means I gave my truth. It was proclaimed until John. And since then, the gospel of the kingdom is preached, which means I will talk liberation. And everyone is forcing whose way? Yes. No, it's not God's way. His way into it. Which means they're saying, I can walk in sin. I can walk in rebellion. I can be disobedient. I can act like a bastard child and I'm going to still go to heaven. Okay, listen to me. That's what it's saying here. They're forcing their way into it. I'm all right. Even though I walk in rebellion. Well, you know, over there in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, it says a person with that attitude will never be forgiven. And I, I had meant to show you this scripture in Luke. No, it's Psalm 16, thank you, Lord. Psalm 16 talks about committing sins of knowing better and says even the blood of Jesus is of no effect in your life. That's what we're talking about, breaking covenant. Breaking covenant with the knowledge of covenant. Okay, listen and tell me. I think I'll show you Psalm 16. And I'm going to rabbit trail already. You ready? Still there. I just want to be sure it's still there. I got it in flaming orange. I think I like it in red to remind myself of it. It talks about, in the first three verses, about the saints. The word saints mean those who are sanctified and made holy. And so the fourth verse makes a statement. It says, the sorrows of those, is that in your Bible, of those who have bartered for, what's those next two words? Another God. Another God. Wait a minute. The sorrow of those who have done what? Barter. barter. When you think about the word barter, what does that mean to you? Trading. Trading. And we use, do we, do we, are we involved in trade and exchange today in our life? Amen. And what do we use for the trading? Money. Money. Is that right? So these folks are involved in some usage of something of monetary value or of money. But they are bought it for another God, a God of rebellion, a God of disobedience. The sorrows of those people, he says, will be what? Multiplied. Is that in your Bible? And so he talks about their libations of blood. You know how they, you know, libations of blood. Oh, God. Please deliver me, Lord. Lord, just deliver me. I mean, you're literally praying the word, literally them. You'll begin to sweat like great drops of blood like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Trying so hard to touch God. Knowing that the doors of heaven is closed to you. <coughs> the Lord says, I shall not pour out their libations of blood. You see, your prayers, your praise might went up. God, I might go to the rabbit trail. There's an angel in heaven that stands God before the altar of God and every voice that went up from this house tonight and all over Houston, Texas, whether it was a holler church or a true church, was placed into that cup. And the angel then takes the prayers, which is the incense of the people of God, and he pours it right before the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
right on the altar. <coughs> I wonder how many did the Lord go, scalp you, rottenness, get that one away from me. The only prayers that are allowed into that court of heaven are those that come from a heart of obedience. It's incredible. And the rest of them is mixed with an incense from God and flung back to the earth in judgment. He says, nor shall I take their names upon my lips. I want the Lord to be able, when he hear me pray, to stand in an obsession for me and say, Father, give Victor the petitions of his heart. There are those that God says they have bought or use their money for another God. Can I tell you what that, who that God is? Everybody know who that God is? It's the God of self. Let me get back on track, all right? Now, I gave you a script this morning in Malachi 3. Malachi 3. Thank you for the storm, Lord. We don't run and complain. We need the rain. Amen? Amen. Is that right? Amen. Hallelujah. We don't run and complain about anything. We learn to bless God in all things, persevere in all things. It's a way of life for the overcomer. Malachi 3. And I told you this morning about God's sarcasm. Let's look at it again because I'm going to show you. There's another time in scripture, and I had forgotten about this, but Julio, who runs him and his wife, and who runs a tape, the radio ministry, is at my home, and he's making radio broadcasts for the month of August. We mailed it across the country. And he said, you know, brother, remember that time you told us about two years ago about the tithes and the altar? I've forgotten about it. And he reminded me that the Lord did not even move in behalf of these people. They came back to that part about the honesty of the tithes and the offering. So I got in here and looked it up right quick tonight. In Malachi 3, this is what he says. <clears throat> verse 7. And verse 7 has to do with the 30th chapter of Exodus, verses 11 through 16. You don't, let me tell you something right now. If you're dishonest in your tithes and offerings, I don't care how many gifts and miracles you're involved in, God will even count you as a part of his kingdom or part of his family. That's why I don't count nobody. Oh, you listen to me. I will not count anyone. Because I've learned this law of God's kingdom. I don't ask why it's his law. It's his law and he's God. And I've learned it. Or listen to me. And so these people are in a backslidden condition. Every prophet wrote to people in a backslidden condition. A people who have broken covenant. And so he, he's speaking here, even as the Lord spoke to us in the third chapter of Revelation, about repenting and returning to him. And so in Malachi 3, he says in verse 7, from the days of your fathers, the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy will tell you that your father is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I told you this morning, if you really belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed. And I'm going to say this to you. Only those who are walking in total obedience is what God calls, counts as Abraham's seed. Which means when Abraham paid tithes, I was in his loins of faith, therefore I paid tithes. He says, from the days of your fathers, being way back from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have turned aside, which means you've bought it for another God, from my statutes, you have not kept them. Return to me, and what does God say? I will return to you. Let me ask you a question. Do we, are we trying to return to God with a whole heart tonight? Amen. And so they have a question. They say, how shall we return? We know that one way to return is to communion, the communion table. Is that right? And so many excommunicate themselves from that Wednesday night service because they think that part of God's covenant is not important. Another way to return is through fasting and prayer. That's why we have Thursday night. Just to make sure that we, we've got the pillows in our midst of returning to the Lord. That's why. This is what he says. And so God has a question. They have a question. God has a question. They said, Lord, how can we return to you? And here comes God with the sarcasm. He says, will a man rob God? You can't rob God, dear God. Amen? And so he says, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed thee? And what, what answer does God give? In tithes and offering. And what is he talking about? Returning to him. Is that right? And he says, you bring the whole tithe into my storehouse so that there may be food in my house and Test me not in this, says one of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven, pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And so you're saying, Lord, I want the, the, the powers of hell broken in my life. 
He says, until you come to this point of obedience, verse 11 will not take place. And I already set you up about if you, if you, and what do you say, followers? Yeah. Then. And God says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it may not destroy the fruits of your ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its weight, says Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Is that also in your Bible? Amen. Now, let me show you an example in the 29th chapter of Second Chronicles. This all began to take place in a time of a man named Hezekiah. And let me tell you about that time. When Hezekiah came on the throne, people of God, this man had a heart for God. Up to his time, the other kings were evil men. And don't forget this. The purpose of the kings in the Old Testament was God's representatives who represented the God of heaven on his throne. And there had been a succession of evil kings, men who took no delight in the law of God, who were not moved by the word of God. They could hear all the word of God given to them. They weren't controlled by the word of God. But instead, these kings were controlled by the lust of the flesh. And they built asterisks, and they worshipped Baal, and they built groves, you know. God had a place that said, you go here and make your sacrifices, and keep slaughtering the sheep, and keep slaughtering those pigeons and turtle doves. It was such a smelly place. They said you could have smelled the, the stench of the rottenness of all the sacrifices that had gone on five miles where you ever got there. What God was simply trying to say to them was, keep that smelly, rotten smell before you, and know that's what sin smells like to me. And so these kings had a better idea, and these evil kings built groves, and they made palatial places, and wonderful, beautiful trees, and they did away with all the bloody sacrifices. Let me tell you something. Where I'm preaching is a bloody gospel. It's a, it's a bloody covenant. Look at this, Tim Jeremy. It costed his blood for this covenant of God to be enacted on our lives. And there are obediences to this covenant. And so Hezekiah comes to the throne, and looks at the 29th chapter. And let's look at the fifth and the sixth verse. He said to them, verse 5, Listen to me, O Levites. Somebody help me. Who are the Levites? Free. Tell me out loud, who are the Levites? Free. They're the priests of God. Are you the priests of God today? Amen. And he speaks to the Levites. Those people who are supposed to know God's laws. He said, Listen to me, O Levites. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanliness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful. I just got to a meeting about faithfulness one ago. If you're unfaithful in the least of little things, our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him. They've turned their face away from the dwelling place of the Lord. They've turned their backs. Is it also in your Bible? Amen. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 8. Therefore, what has God done to them? The wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of terror, of horror, of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. Let me tell you something. When you find a bunch of diseased, sickly, ardent, fighting people, you're looking at people whom the Lord has given over to the power of darkness. Or just them tell me. Because when you walk in God's covenant, none of these things should be a part of your life. It's part of God's part. Let me tell you something. And God is faithful to do his part. This is what he says. Verse 9. For behold, our fathers, our fathers, that means your leaders, have fallen by the sword. And our sons and our daughters and our wives and our wives are in what? Captivity for this. Notice what people are saying about how rebellious their sons and their daughters are. It goes right back to the covenant of the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. God says, I will turn your offspring over to others, and you can do nothing but look at them helpless. And the others are the powers of darkness, are the powers of hell. But yet in God's covenant, he says, I will save not only you, but I'll reach out and save your household. And they wonder, I wonder why my son and my daughter don't have a heart for God. I just wonder what's wrong with them. I preach, I teach them, I show them the truth, I do all these things, and it's like it has no effect on them. Because God is in charge. And so, this is what Hezekiah says in the 10th verse. Church, would you please read out loud the 10th verse? He says, now it is in my what? Heart to do what? 
Amen. to make a covenant with God. You think no Bible? Amen. See, and I'm hoping that as you learn what salvation is in these series of messages, that something is coming to your heart and saying, what is wrong with me? What is my attitude against God? What is this blatancy of evil and rebellion that I know better and can still feel justified in breaking God's covenant? But Hezekiah says, it's in my heart to make covenant with God. Why? That his burning anger may turn away from us. Wait a minute. God's burning anger turning away from who? Us. us. Is that your Bible? And so, he makes covenant. Go on down to the 31st chapter. In fact, I hope you read this whole detail. Uh, and let me tell you something else. I'm going to the 31st chapter. But let me show you something about the tithes and offers. I showed this morning about God watching the attitude. Is that right? It's the attitude. If you're under compulsion and said, well, I better tie because I don't want God to get me. Forget about it. Amen. He's going to get you. Because it wasn't given with the right attitude. Amen. And so, in the 31st verse of that 29th chapter, you'll discover he talks about how God only accepts it from those who are willing. Are you listening to me? And so, I'm going to go to the 31st chapter. Notice the 12th verse. Chapter 31, verse 12. Would you please read out loud to me, please, the first seven verses. I mean, first seven words. And the tithe. Is that in your Bible? They faithfully brought them in. Is that in your Bible? And the consecrated things, and Kananiah, the Levite, was the officer in charge of them, and his brother Shelly, I was second. Well, it goes through all this. All of a sudden, they begin to return to God in all the things that God called his way of his walk of covenant. Is that right? Go to the 20th verse. And thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good, he did what was right, and he did what was true before the Lord his God. And every work which he began in the service of the house of God in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did, he did, with how much? All his heart, and he what? He prospered. Is that in your Bible? Then it says in chapter 32, now chapter 32 is to show you that when the enemies come against your life, and you're found in unfaithfulness in all things, how God really <coughs> wipes them out. And so we go to the 32nd chapter, and the first verse says, after these acts of, what does he say? Faithfulness. Here comes devils. Sennacherib, that's the devil. He comes to attack him. Is that clear? But where is, he, where is Hezekiah walking? He's walking in faithfulness. How is he walking? He's walking in what? Faithfulness. And so the powers of hell are coming to attack him. But he's a man that's found where? In covenant faithfulness. What do you think God's going to do? He's protected by the covenant. Go to verse 7. God says, be strong and courageous. Don't fear or be dismayed because the king of Syria, of, of Assyria, that's Sennacherib who came against him, nor because of all the multitude that is with him. For the one who is greater, excuse me, for one with us is greater than the one with him. God is only with us when we walk in, in all covenant keeping. Is that clear? With him only is an arm of what? Flesh. But with us, is the Lord our God to help us and to do what else? To fight our battles. And the people rely on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Is it also in your Bible? Amen. Look at it says in verse 22. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. And what did God do? He guarded them. He guarded them where how? On Every side is it also in your Bible. Think about it. He came to a place of covenant faithfulness, and God just protected him on all sides. Is that clear? Now, we left off this morning and was talking about the seventh chapter of Hebrews, about when we're paying our tithes, we literally are offering up this incense to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who's the Lord of Sabbath. Is that right? And I left off showing you about the priestly clothing, and I want you to go to that because... Jesus said to us, let me remind you again of the 16th chapter of Luke. He said, who's going to give you the true riches? Which means there's no way God's going to dress you in his holiness. 
What are the true riches? Riches being dressed in God's holiness. There's no way. It's impossible. If you're not dressed in God's holiness, people of God, the Bible says very clearly, you'll never see God. Is that right? Without holiness, no man will see God. He says, you pursue the sanctification without which no man will see the Lord. And so in Leviticus, let's go there, please. The 8th chapter. Leviticus 8. Leviticus chapter 8. And let's begin to look at the priestly garment. And notice verse 22. And let me say something to you. If you know that you are a king and a priest, just say, praise the Lord, he's made me so. Praise the Lord, he's made me so. Stop and think about it. Say it again and mean it from the heart. Praise the Lord, he's made me so. What has God made you? And how did he do it? By his what? By his blood. Let that sink in. Did you know, listen to this, that the priest, the priest of God, have always been a wave offering to God from the earth? That means everything I do in life as a priest of God is like I'll, I'll, I'm content to wave into the Father. Hello, Father. Hello, Father. That God's true priests are like sweet incense and perfume going up to his nostrils. And everything that I touch in life is saying to the Father, Hello, Father. It's a covenant, a friendship, a trust, a relationship. Because God has made me to be a priest. Made you to be a priest. And so, all of a sudden, we come to this eighth chapter, and God is doing something with Moses, who is a shadow of Jesus Christ who is a shadow of Jesus Christ the covenant of Moses is a shadow of the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden this covenant this blood begins to affect even the dress and so in verse 22 Then he presented the second ram, the ram of ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. And Moses slaughtered it and took some of its, what's that word? Blood. Blood. And he put it on the low of Aaron's, which ear? Right. right ear. Why was it put on his ear? What did we do with the ear? Yeah. We, what? we hear, which means a sensitivity to whatever God says. And on the thumb of his what? Right. right hand. What purpose is the thumb? It's everything. I guarantee you, life would be totally different if you didn't have just that thing called the thumb. So you listen to me. And not only was the blood put there, blood was put there. And on the big toe of his right foot. Ever try to walk about your big toe? You don't want to, believe me. It serves as a balancer. Well, listen to me. He also had Aaron's sons come near. And Moses put some of the blood on the lobe of their right ear and on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. Why? Because they were the seed of Aaron. The priesthood. Moses then sprinkled the rest of the blood. Where did he sprinkle the rest of the blood? Right. Around the altar. He took the fat, the fat of the tail, the fat of the backwards on the entrails, and the lobe of the liver, the two kidneys, and their fat in the right thigh. And from the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unmixed cake and one cake of bread, mixed with all one wafer, placed them on the portions, the fat on the right thigh. All of a sudden we see the, we see the symbols of the communion table. By the way, fat means giving God the what? Yes. Best. Is that right? He then, he then, listen carefully, he then put all these on the hands of Aaron, on the hands of his son, and presented them as a what? Wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them from their hands, Offered them up in smoke on the altar with the burnt offering. They were an ordination offering for a soothing aroma. It was an offering by fire, which means parity to the Lord. Moses also took the breast and presented it as a wave offering for the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the Ram ordination, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So Moses took some of the, what's that next two words? <laughs> what does that only ball stand for? The Holy Spirit, doesn't it? He took some of the anointing oil. There's your symbol of the Holy Ghost. The anointing of God. 
He took some of the blood which was on the what? Altar. altar. Why is the blood of the altar? Because God had accepted the blood. He took the Holy Ghost symbol. The symbol of acceptance. And he did what with this? He sprinkled it. On Aaron. On his what? Garments. On his sons. On the garments of his sons with him. And his sons and the garments of his sons with him. Is that your Bible? All of a sudden, something is brought into the picture about garments. And I read today in James 5, James 5, you know, that's the scripture talks about healing. If there's any sick among you, there's a call for the elders of the church. What we didn't realize, before James 5 and the healing scriptures is James chapter 1, James chapter 2, James chapter 3, James chapter 4. At the beginning of James 5, the healing doesn't take place unless all five chapters are being obeyed. But they never told us that. It's a quick formula to bring them up here. Run with all. Go to the 38th chapter of Exodus for a moment. All of a sudden, Garments come into play. James 5 also brought garments into play and said, Your garments are moth eaten, full of holes. Your nakedness is shown unto God. And so, in the 30th chapter of Exodus, the 21st verse, You ready? Because again, it goes back into the tithes and the offerings. Let me help you. In Malachi 3, it said the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his, what was it he was coming to? Yeah. His what? Yeah. Tell me out loud. His what? Yeah. I couldn't hear you. His what? Yeah. Somebody help me. Tell me out loud. Where is the temple of God? Yeah. But I thought it be built in Jerusalem. Where is the temple of God? Yes. Where is the temple of God? Yes. So if God is coming to his temple, in Acts 3, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Peter 1, all tell me that the prophets were talking to my day, and Malachi is one of the prophets, and God's coming to his temple, where is he coming to? Us. And he tell you, he has come. You know what the Lord is doing? He's finishing up the product and the work that he began with all of us when we first said, Jesus, come to my life. I told you last week, if you miss the move of God and what he's doing now and don't get in on it in agreement and cooperation, you are lost for all eternity. There is no time after this time. We're in a grace period. I told you the seven trumpet has blown. When it blew in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't even recognize it. And it went on for another 30 years. And they still missed it. Get on a rabbit trail, let me continue. We come back to something about the temple. Now all of a sudden we get an understanding of the power and the purpose of the tithe of God in the temple. And so in this 30th chapter, let's take please uh, verse 21. This is the number of the things for the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony. As they were numbered according to the command of Moses for the service of the old Levites by the hand of Ithamar, the son of Abram, the priest. Is it also in your Bible? Now, Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. 
And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ashamach, the son of Dan, an engraver, a skillful workman, and a weaver in blue and in purple. Blue meaning the purity of God, God's color. Purple meaning royalty. And what verse are you in? I am too. Where's the rest? Don't keep up. Don't get left behind in the covenant. Amen? Amen. Say this with me. I'm not going to be left behind. I'm getting on the stick. Let me begin to read. All the gold. Don't miss the word gold. Meaning purity. That was used for the work. The work of the tabernacle. The work of God's temple. All the work of the sanctuary. Even the gold of the wave offering. And it goes through this 29 talents and 730 shackles according to the shackle of the what? Sanctuary. And this was a tithe of the offering. Is that right? And the silver of those of the congregation who were numbered was 100 talents and 1,775 shackles according to the shackle of the sanctuary. Let me ask you a question. How many men came out of Egypt led by Moses? Everybody tell me a lot. How many? Five million. Would you believe we're about to read about a remnant that was obedient to the shock of the sanctuary? A bet, a becca, verse 26, a head, that is, half a shackle, according to the shock of the sanctuary, for each one who passed over to those who were what? Numbered. You only count it when you're faithful in the tithes and the offering. From 20 years old and upward was how many thousand? 603,550 men. Got a question. Where is the other 4 million plus? Where is their shackle? This thing goes on and on about this building of God's tabernacle. Shadow of the spiritual, of the reality of that which is eternal. Now in the 39th chapter, moreover from the blue and purple, verse 1, and scarlet material. Don't miss that. Here comes this material again. They made finely woven garments for doing what? <laughs> Ministering in the holy place as well as the what kind of garments? Holy garments just as what he commanded Moses. And he made the ephod of gold and of blue and of purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Then they hammered out gold sheets and cut them into threads to be woven able to blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen. The work of a skillful workman look at me. We're not reading to you about folks what the angels of God are doing in us, but are obedient. Unless there's a hammering going on, there's some stretching going on. We are being dressed up with what we're going to wear for all eternity. We will either be dressed up in shame or we'll be dressed up in God's glory. And it's all based on obedience. And Jesus shows us this part of salvation. It says, if you're unfaithful in that thing about the tithes and offering, who in the world is going to give you the true riches? I'm reading now about our eternal garment. I could have talked of this from the, was it, 12th chapter of Revelation, verse 1. The woman clothed with the sun. I learned to taught you a long time ago what you look like in the spirit realm when you became the salvation. That your garment is more brilliant than any sun. And we get holes in our garments. James 5 says the holes come in the garments from the unfaithful of the tithes and the offerings. See, Jesus said to us very clearly, he said, can the prey be taken for the mighty man? He said, the prayer of the tower will be rescued. He says, your de devil says, the destroyers will depart from you, and your builders will hurry. I like that word hurry, don't you? I like the words that says, he will do what? Restore the years of the lost. <laughs> hurry up, Lord, and restore the years. I like it when he was saying, get the other good eyes to see, and return to me. I would quickly subdue their enemies. I like those words. Because I've wasted a lot of my walk in salvation. How about you? Amen. 
And so all of a sudden, we see all this, this, all of a sudden, there's a garment being fashioned for the priest, and there's gold, and there's, there's, there's a scarlet material, and there's blue, and there's hammering going on, and there's an ephah, which means a garment of protection. And all of a sudden, we keep reading, and all of a sudden, there's all these jewels and precious gems being placed in his garment. What did I tell you? It's a shadow of the garment for eternity that I hope to be wearing. Let me tell you something. Can you imagine that whenever Aaron and his sons walk through the camp, they could say, that goes one of the priests, the way he's wearing. Give me hurry, that's what he says. You see, can't you hear Ezekiel 16 ringing in your ears? Don't you hear Ezekiel 16? Y'all remember Ezekiel 16? Okay, in Ezekiel 16, it talks about the bride of Christ becoming a whore. It talks about how God had dressed them in his fine garment. It talks about special garments of embroidered work. It talks about how that this harlot became a seductress with all the things of the flesh. And how that God ripped her garment off of her. And talk about how in her self-righteousness, she could look down her long spiritual nose, her round flat nose, and all the other was walking in sin. And how God says, when I get to dealing with you in judgment, you're going to understand something, that your harlotry, just breaking my covenant, make all the real harlots and the street walkers on the street look like righteousness compared to what you've done against me. And you know better. He says, I'm going to close your mouth, oh harlot. He said, you make Solomon and Gomorrah appear righteous by what you've done. And it all began with the garment. It talked about the gifts. It talked about how we were building churches on every corner in that 16th chapter. And God will stand there all hollered houses. Sounds like America, doesn't it? There's a church on every corner. There's going to be a whole house of your choice. As long as you don't walk in covenant. You accept it. Baptize you. Let you put your name on the road. I want you to there's a role in a church down here, folks. My name's on a role in heaven. Amen. Don't you hear Ezekiel 16 now? Amen. Let's keep reading. Look at it says in the fourth verse. I mean, this cat is being dressed up. Some like of the days which get our suits made. And the pillow is fitting, you know, and pulling and stretching and twisting and turning and we come out sometimes wearing clothes that feel as light as wind. Don't you know those days are over, Sonny? <laughs> we were Mr. Pros Mr. 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 Prosperity. Thank God that we're rags in this world and rich in Him, glory to God. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 4. They made attaching shoulder pieces for the ephah. It was attached at its two upper ends. And the skillfully woven band, which was only like its workmanship of the same material, of, blue, of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material. Fine twisted. What's that material? Linen. Don't miss the linen. No, it's not wool, not cotton. Linen. Right. Just as what he commanded Moses. And they made the, what kind of stones? Onyx stones. Wait a minute. I remember reading about these stones in Genesis. Don't you? And all of a sudden, they're placed on our priestly garments. One time they was in Eden and now they're on us. Oh. Yeah. They were set in gold. <laughs> Filigree settings. They were engraved like the engravings of a signet. What's a signet for? Seal of what? Of approval of a what usually? Ring. And the ring is for what? Authority. Can you imagine it being dressed in God's authority? I'm talking about spiritual things, y'all. And these things are the times in your offering. So ridiculous what we do with our salvation. 
How nicely we regard these things. I don't care what you your hall of churches. Because we, we're going to Mount Zion. We're just in Amen. He says, according to the names which are natures of the sons of Israel. And he placed them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as what kind of stones? Memorial. And I told you this morning, we talked about memorial. What is it pointing to? Covenant. Stones of covenant. Faithfulness to covenant. And God says, you're faithful in my covenant. I'm dressing you up in my jewels. What are the jewels? The beauty of holiness. He would give me faithfulness in something as filthy as money. He calls it filthy lucre. There were memorials of the sons of Israel, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he made the breastplate, ho ho, breastplate of armor. The work of a skillful workman, like the workmanship of the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It was square. They made the double, the breastplate folded double. <laughs> How many arrows did you get in that breastplate? Hmm? A span long, a span wide, and folded double. They mounted four rows of stones in it. The first row was a row of ruby, topaz, and emeralds, and the second row of turquoise, and a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row of jannix, and an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row of pearl, and onyx, and jasper. They were set in gold filigree, filigree settings when they were mounted, and the stones were corresponding to the names of the sons of Israel. There were twelve corresponding to their names, engraved with the engraving of a signet each with its name for the twelve tribes, and they made on the breastplate chains like cords of twisted cordage work in pure gold. Let me ask you a question. If you're a king and a priest, say, Amen, I am. God made me to be. Amen. Are you getting an idea what you're like in the spirit realm? Amen. And they made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate and they put the two gold cords and the two rings on the end of the breastplate. And they put the other two of the two cards in the two third base settings and placed them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. And they made two gold rings and placed them on the two ends of the breastplate on its inner edge, which was next to the ephod. Furthermore, they made two gold rings and placed them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod on the front of it, close to the place where it was joined above the woven, woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue card that it might be on the woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate might not come loose. From the ephod, just as the Lord had com commanded Moses. Then he made the robe of the ephod of woven work all of blue, and the opening of the robe was at the top, in the center, at the opening of a coat of mail, with a binding all around his opening, that it might not be torn. Isn't it amazing? The work that God to says, it won't come loose, and it, and it cannot be torn. Amen. And don't miss this pomegranate business. What's the pomegranate? Ah, you got it, glory. <laughs> because you wait till you see where the fruit is placed. You gonna learn what Zachariah talks about. Verse twenty-four. They made pomegranates of blue, purple, scarlet material, twisted linen on the hem of the robe. On the what? Hem of the robe. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around on the hem of the road. Let me ask you a question. What kind of sound does a bell make? Ring. Ding dong, ring, is that right? Can you imagine everywhere you walk, they hear the ringing of God, of God's work, on your road? Are you with me? Amen. <laughs> There's a bell and, a, and fruit. There's a ringing of God and there's a fruit to back it. There's a bell and a pomegranate. Don't you understand? Amen. Verse 26. All taking a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the road for the service just as Lord had commanded Moses. And they made the tunics of finely woven linen for Aaron and his sons. Who did they make this for? Aaron and his sons. But you see, Aaron and his sons have lost the mind of the flesh. They got the mind of Christ. How do I know? Because I come to that turban business again. And the turban was of fine linen and the decorated caps of fine linen. And the linen breeches of fine twisted linen. Notice it's always linen. Right? I gave you one in Revelation. And there was these saints dressed in the heavenlies and they were wearing what? Fine linen. 
O and the armies which were in heaven following him upon white horses dressed in fine what? Linen. Is that Revelation 19? And it may help you. That ain't for later in the future. That is for right now. And what's the tell of the white horse? No, no, no. The white horse. Not the rider of the white horse. And that's behind him. It's not by might, not by power. But it's by his spirit, says the Lord. The horse in the natural is flesh. The horse in the spirit represents the power of the work of the Holy Ghost. Is that right? We need to start Bible school up again. Some of us are slipping. And folks, watch this. <laughs> I like this. Because I know what I'm reading. And I want you to know too. Verse 29. And the sash of fine twisted linen in blue and purple and scarlet material. The work of the weaver, just as Lord had commanded Moses. And they put the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and inscribed it like the engravings of a signet. And what does it say? Holy I couldn't hear you. It says what? Holy Tell me out loud like you mean Now, don't forget that word just said, holy to the Lord. In other words, whatever this is put on has come to a place where they're beyond the justification than a place of sanctification. And everything they do, they're over the hill now. They may go further. They have reached a place where it is impossible for them to sin. And everything in their life says, holy to the Lord. And guess what? They're not straining. They're not trying. They have been made a finished product. And it's for those of us in the earth. We go farther. And they fasten a blue card to it to fasten it on the turban above. In other words, the turban can't come off, the clothes can't be torn, and the breastplate can't come loose. The mind of Christ can't be ripped off. Just as only commanded Moses. Uh, did you catch that part? Now, turn over to the book of Zechariah. And everything that the Lord made was crying out. What was he crying out again? To tell me out loud. I couldn't hear you. I almost heard you. Now, you must go to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is the prophet that saw the completed work of God upon God's people. This is a prophet that saw in the third chapter when there was a high priest named Joshua standing before God with filthy garments up. And he saw this this high priest crying out to God, Lord, deliver me from my filthiness. And it was that third chapter of Zechariah where he tells us how Jesus, who's Lord, speaks to the mighty angels and says, take those filthy garments off of him. What's your filthy garments? Rebellion, the hatred, the wickedness, the malice, the dishonesty. That's what we're dressed in as human beings. who are born dressed up in filth. And so he says, <laughs> they put this wonderful garment on and put a turban on his head. And looks like, if you obey me, Joshua, and learn my ways, I will give you free access among those standing here. Let me just short take it. I'm trying to kill demons with the word of God tonight. Go to the third chapter of Zechariah. Zachar Let me show you this right quick. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Somebody help me. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus. Tell me out loud. Jesus. So when I come before God to pray, do I show up by myself? Of course not. I already know that Satan's going to show up. How do I know? Because Jesus gives us the example right there. Is that right? Amen. And so I'm praying to God, and I'm hearing inside my mind what Satan is screaming to God in heaven about me. He's filthy! He's lustful! He's dishonest! And I'm hearing these thoughts in my mind. You're no good. You'll never make it. You might as well quit. That's what Satan is shouting to God. But I'm ignoring Satan. I'm saying, Lord, deliver me. Lord, sanctify me. Lord, purify me. Take out of me the nature of Victor Brute. I am filthy, Lord. Lord, I will be found like I am. Take away my personality. Give me yours, Lord. And that's what Joshua's doing. And there's Satan. He shows up too. 
And so, all of a sudden, Satan's at his right hand to accuse him, and all of a sudden, the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the what? Wow. Wait a minute. Wait. I remember reading this morning that I told you in tape number five about when the Lord came to his temple, he will sit down as a purifier of what? Fire. No, he didn't say fire. He's using fire. Of the sons of who? Levi. Levi. And Levi represents the what? Priesthood. And so the priesthood is hurled into hell's fire. Why? To force you to come to a place where you say, Lord, I can't live this life. Save me, Lord. Save me. And that's what Joshua had come to. I've been there. I've been there hell and back. I keep telling you that. And I haven't arrived yet. But I'm in a place I don't care less what a human being thinks. God done the work. Amen. Or just done it. Or what Amen. demons think. Not boasting of what God has done. He's still got some more to do. Amen. And he's doing it. Amen. And so we begin to read this the thing about garments again. Verse 3. And Joshua was clothed with what? Filthy garments. But there he was. Standing, this is in the right place. Where was he standing? Before the angel of the Lord. Let me tell you tonight. I watched you people start by doing this like praising God. And I was thinking, God's eyes are looking down, and he is seeing garments of filthiness. Garments are being changed. Garments are cleansed. Garments are showing up spots in them. See, everything we give to God goes up like smoke. But when these Catholic priests got this instance thing, they got it wrong. But see, what they don't understand is. That ain't the incense God is smelling. He's smelling your life. He's smelling your attitudes. He's smelling your motives. And even the things you give, he is smelling. Was that from a pure heart? Well, I can't use that. But what's he saying? There is a son in whom is all my delight. Here's Jesus giving the order to the angels of God. Verse 4. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments. By the way, the filthy garments is the soul that sins with knowledge. Again, he said to him, See, now he's explaining to Joshua what the filthy garments are. He says, I have taken away your what? Iniquity from you, and I'm going to clothe you with what? Festal robes. Then I say, the eye there is the of God speaking. Let them put a clean turban on his head. There's your mind of Christ. So they put a clean turban on his head. They clothed him with garments. While the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying. These are words of covenant. The angel is Jesus speaking directly to Joshua. Here's what he says to him. Thus says one of hosts. If you will walk in my ways. And if you will perform my servants, then you will also govern my house and also have free charge of my courts and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. Is it also in your Bible? Which means when you come in covenant, guess what? The angel of God says, you're welcome to come in God's presence. But what happens if you're not in covenant? You remember that angel that was assigned in the Garden of Eden that was standing every which way with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life? He says, let me tell you something. As long as you may beg it, you are not allowed to come to the tree of life. Okay, listen, gentlemen. When you come to covenant, he says, I see how filthy you are. I see how messed up you are, how weak you are. But you've been to covenant. You can come to my courts now. Okay, listen, gentlemen. Now, before I go any further, that was a message inscribed on these priestly garments. And it, it was crying out, what was he crying to the Lord? Tell me one more time. Holy to the Lord. It was crying out what? Holy to the Lord. Now, let me show you how the guy that's unfaithful his money to God <laughs> ain't even counted as part of God's kingdom. He's not in God's kingdom. God didn't even consider them. Go to the 14th chapter of Zechariah, please. By the way, did they tell you this when they told you to come out front? No, no. Of course not. Did your prosperity liar tell you this too? Mm. 
Notice the 16th verse of that 14th chapter. It will come about any, 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 who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the feast of what? Booths. Can somebody help me? What is the feast of booths? What'd you say? It's repentance. Is that right? It was also something that was done to remember all the wasted years of our wanderings in the wilderness. Is that right? Talk to me, folks. Don't go batty on me now. I'm coming to the exciting part. Am I talking to people that's returning to God with the whole heart or not? Amen. This is what he says. He says, And it shall be, verse 17, now, folks, the way you worship God is through covenant. That whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, got a question. What Jerusalem is that talking about? <laughs> Tell me out loud, because we got people all the time listening in and watching the videotapes that thinks I've lost my mind. Tell them out loud, church. Which Jerusalem is this? I couldn't hear you. Which one? And when do we go to the heavenly Jerusalem? When we come to salvation. Is that what Hebrews 12 says? Okay. Let's continue. Whichever does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, you worship him in obedience. The Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Is that in your Bible? There will be no rain on them. And for those that bought the millennium lie, why is it raining in the millennium? If all things are put back in order in the millennium. Mm hmm? What's the purpose of rain? To cause, to cause what? Growth. What kind of growth? Spiritual growth. Is that right? So these folks need some spiritual growth. They're getting some spiritual growth. Is that right? Verse 18, and if the family of Egypt does not go up, go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. That's those that's worldly minded. And so, if it's a millennium, how did disease get here, huh? I've heard these millennium liars. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up and celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate, who do not go up to celebrate the feast of booze. They will come back to repentance. And that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the what? Horses. What's, what's, what's inscribed there? I just read that. Did you? But wait a minute. Horses. Which horses are these? The white horses. And what are they talked about? Revelation 19. I'm on my white horse tonight. Amen. I can just see myself saying, getting up, let's move on, Holy Ghost. <laughs> and the cooking pots in the Lord's house. Got a question? <laughs> I'm going to get you with this one. Maybe not. What are the cooking pots? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you smarties. Are we the farm pans? Yes. Say, I'm the cooking pot. I'm the cooking pot. I'm God's cooking pot. I'm God's cooking pot. Whatever he said do, Whatever he said, do. I'm going to be found doing. I'm going to be found doing. Now watch what happens. All of a sudden, there is a characteristic about the cooking pots that is a exact duplicate and kind of the altar of God. You ready? Aren't you glad you came on a rainy night? Amen. Lord, rain on us too. Amen. And every cooking pot, glory to God. And the cooking pots in the Lord's house would be like the bowls before the altar. Bowls before the altar. 
What's the purpose of the bowls before God's altar? Collecting what? Incense. What are these bowls collecting? Our records of obedience. Our records of faithfulness. In every cooking pot, in Jerusalem and in Judah, will be what? Holy to the world of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. Here comes the money part again. Before I go any further, what spirit is it that causes dishonesty in the tithes and offerings? Canine. Tell me out loud. The Canaanite spirit, is that right? Read the rest of this and discover who ain't there. And there will what? There will no longer be a Canaanite where? Is that is that plain? There will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of all of hosts in that day. Now, in the 12th chapter of Revelation, all the way to the 12th chapter, let me show you this about the incense and the bowls in Acts 10. I mentioned this morning, and Pastor Holmes even felt led to close the meeting with it this morning. Now that was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius. He was a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was a devout man. He was one who feared God with all his household. This man's house was in order. He gave many alms to Jewish people and he prayed to God continually. Is that in your Bible? About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of a God who had just come into him and said, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze upon him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And don't miss what God said to that man. I told you God watches the attitude. He said to him, Your prayers and your what? Alms. Alms. Is it also in your Bible? Mm -hmm. Your prayers and your what? Alms. Alms. And then it says, Gifts of your love and gifts of your charities. That's what it says. Have done what? Ascended. Have done what? Ascended. But I thought only vapor and clouds ascended. And smoke ascended. When you are giving in that bucket, folks, you are either having ascended up the testimony of Anna and Sapphira and faithfulness and lying, or you're having a memorial of faithfulness to God's commandment. Is that clear? So send it up as a what? Memorial. And what does memorial always point to? Covenant before God. And what does God do? He brings this man to eternal life. To the truth of eternal life. To the knowledge of eternal life. And to the way of eternal life. Just because he was a man of prayer and a man of giving. Say this with me. I give to obey. I give to obey. I'm not giving to get rich. I'm not giving to get rich. In this world. God is my riches, is my riches. Even, in this world. even in this world it's like incense to God is that right? Yeah. now let's move on to the 12th chapter of Revelation and uh, and then look at the 19th chapter and I think that will close out this part of the covenant concerning the tithes and offering part and uh, God's way is always right isn't it? Amen. Now here's what we look like in the spirit realm. And a great sign appeared in heaven, I'm in the 12th chapter, verse 1. And this is only for those who are in total faithfulness. Let me tell you, in all things. Let me throw it in again. Not just a tithe and offering part. Family life, you're out doing your job, everyday life, the witnessing the folks that you know, the reaching out to the family that's lost. It's what we look like. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman. The woman is a church. And what is she clothed with? She's clothed with the sun. Oh, wait a minute. Who clothed her? God clothed her. Does she have authority? You can bet your bottom dollar on it. The moon was under her feet. In other words, a lesser life. Religion. She traveled religion down. It was under her feet. This woman ain't just religious. She walks as a possessor, or oh, you still tell me, of God. And on her head was a crown of what? 
12 thorns, which means she has what? A victor's reign. She's an overcomer. And what is she wearing? She's wearing the glory of the sun. And so we see it in another picture in the 19th chapter of Revelation. Notice verse 7 and 8, Revelation 19, 7 and 8. I'm going to begin in verse 6. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns and will rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. What did the bride do? She dressed herself up in covenant obedience. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine, what's that word? Linen. linen. We just read about the linen a while ago, didn't we? Yeah. It was bright. How bright was it? It's like the sun. But there's something else about it. It was what? Right. Clean. I showed you this morning in 1 Peter 1. When Mark said, I, I want to see it. Remember that? Yeah. And we saw that the righteous acts is doing what to our souls? Purifying. Tell me out loud. Is doing what to our souls? Purifying. Purifying our souls. Is that right? So it's clean. For the fine linen is the what? Righteous. So what does God dress us up in? He dresses us up in what we obey. Period. Is that clear? Now, let's keep reading. He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who invite to marriage of the Lamb. He said to me, These are the true words of God. And by the way, whatever this being was that was excluding John around heaven was a human being that had died and left this world and had become glorified that John didn't even know he was a human being. And we play so carelessly with our great salvation. And so John says in verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship him. Let me tell you something. Don't you know that John knew the laws of God and knew that it was wrong to worship a, a, a man? In other words, John literally fell at his feet as if he was like God. This is what this being says to him. Who's a human being? We don't know who he was. He said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours. Your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who suffered is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes were a flame of fire upon his head of many diadems. One of these diadems is mine. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. Here, here's my part. In fact, this is called Deborah's army in Judges 3. His bride, his helpmate. Verse 14. Judges 3 talks about the same thing. And the armies which are in heaven, folks, we are seated with him in what kind of places? Yes. Tell me out loud. What kind of places? Yes. Where are you seated tonight? In what? Yes. Are we involved in a warfare? Yes. And so are we called to be soldiers? Yes. And when a bunch of soldiers come together, what do they call that bunch of soldiers? Oh. An army. And the armies which are in heaven were clothed in what? Fine linen. White and clean. And, and, and what were they doing? They were following the Lamb wherever He goes. Period. They are following Him on white horses. Amen. Amen. Glory to our God. Hallelujah. Lord, we just worship You. Leader of truth. Word of the living God. We worship You, Lord Jesus. I magnify the power of God and the wisdom of God in giving us, O oh God, direction. Hallelujah. Aha. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come, bless your name. 
You're coming back after a bride, Lord, not a harlot, not a harlot. One that will walk with you in all aspects of the law of covenant, oh God. A bride that is holy, a bride that is pure, a bride that is clean, a bride that shows respect and is reverent, oh God. Father, I bind the words of your glory to this people with his to him, Lord. Take away the Canaanites, hallelujah. Let those bells ring, let the pomegranate, oh God, come forth in our lives. Glory to your name. Let's all just pray tonight, Father, we just come before you. Hallelujah. Lord, some of us have repentance. That's needed. Some of us need, oh God, Lord, to return to the whole heart, Lord, to invest in our lives. And Lord, forgive us for taking for granted the covenant of God. How lightly we've been, oh God, seduced. So easily. No fighting back to be protected. God, I repent. We've been together. We have sinned against you. We've broken covenant. We've been unfaithful like our fathers. We are guilty of sin, Lord. Well, if we can't step on the Lord, Father. We're guilty, we're guilty. But Lord, we don't have to remain in our filter we come back to our first love. We come back to God with our whole heart. Whatever the Lamb of God tells me to do, put your nature in me, Lord, not to do it. Lord, I need a fund of grace, Lord, hallelujah. Whatever you are dead, Lord, Lord, I'm a human being, remember that, hallelujah. Born evil, born in rebellion. Let the will of God be done in this house. Let the will of God be done in every house here, Lord. Let the hand of God be mighty in the temple of God, You see the filth, you see the hypocrisy, you see the pretense, you see the unfaithfulness, you see the whoredoms, you see the rebellion, you see the dishonesty, we confess it. Take it away, Lord, hallelujah. Lord, remember the blood of the covenant. Remember your promise of those that come back with the whole heart. You said, I will forget their sins and iniquities. I will be merciful to their sins and iniquities. I will write my law upon their hearts and upon their minds. I remind God of his words of his faithfulness to those who come back. Hallelujah. Let nothing hinder us, O God. Let there be nothing that we hold on to in our hearts, O God, that causes you to turn away from us. You said when they come into the camp, that better not be found anything unclean or you'll turn away from us. We come back to the power of shed blood, Lord. We come back to the power of cross, Lord. We come back knowing that we have a part to play. Hallelujah. Oh, we are praying. And every head is bowed, every eyes closed. Is there anything that will say, I'm here tonight? For the power of his salvation. I need salvation. I'm not sure of my salvation with God. I've been religious. And I've tried to let religion grant me salvation. But I realize there's a reality with God. Pray for my salvation or not. If that's you, or through God's among us, would you just raise up your hands a little bit? Is there anything that will say, I'm in a, a place of compromise, that there's evil in my life, and I know it, and I'm acknowledging it, and I need to pray tonight. But well, God is with me. Would you just raise your hands to the Lord? The Lord sees your hands. The Lord sees your hands. Anybody else? The Lord sees your hands. The Lord sees your hands here, and over here, and over there. The Lord sees all my hands. He sees the heart saying, Lord, I'm acknowledging my sins. He's taking note of it. Don't you understand that? And he's taking note of it in mercy. Let's just pray. Father, forgive us. 
I have sinned against you. And I ask you to create in me a new home. A clean home. A righteous spirit. A holy spirit. Cause me to love your law. That I may fulfill your word in the earth. Let the powers of hell be broken over my soul. Lord, restore my soul. Prepare my soul. Take away the spots and the wrinkles. The blemishes. And all the holes. Because of my rebellion. I'm denouncing evil tonight. And I'm turning back to God. With my whole heart. Father, have mercy upon me. I know I'm not worthy to call your son. But oh God, blot up my transgression. And create into my soul. Our yearning for the living God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For your word of truth. I'm not going to reject it. I choose to accept it. No matter how much it tears my flesh. Let the will of God be done. Let me be found faithful in all your house. Take away the spirit of the Canaanite. And let me serve you with the whole heart. And with all my soul. This day. This day. I turn my back. I turn my back. On all slowfulness and compromise. All slowfulness and compromise. And I turn back to the living God. I turn back to the living God. No longer my will be done. No longer my will be done. Let the will of God be done. Let the will of God be done. From this hour. From this hour. Let it be written. Let it be written. In the angels of heaven. That my rebellion and my disobedience as a rebellious child ceases to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just just raise our hands. Just praise Him. Praise you. Praise you, O God. Praise your way is right. Praise your will is right. Your will be done, Lord. Your will be done, Lord. Take away my will, Lord. You will be dead, Lord. Take away my will. 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 Take away that the pomegranates come forth, that the bells begin to be heard in heaven. For the lives of these thy people, O God. Let us not be found in a place of compromise for relatives, for mates, for children, for anybody in Jesus' name. But the blood of the Lamb, wherever he goes. Oh, God. Don't see this prosperity life. Let's not be found being deceived any longer. Amen. There's a right way. Let's press into the right way. Lord, we just seal this service in our hearts for thy glory. We join ourselves in the Lord of God, to the Lamb, oh God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fernando, I see you made it back. We want you to come and see our offering tonight. There. I hope God reigns on us every single day with the Holy Spirit. Father, we just thank you for this night. We commit this time in your hands and your word. Father, let every one of us, as we go this week, be fully committed to you, fully devoted to you. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine on us. We bless you tonight. Father, let this time be your time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you need an envelope tonight, just raise your hands and we'll pass out an envelope for the offering. And if you want to uh, uh, put a, a dollar towards the uh, 
the uh, policeman. Yeah, we, didn't get we didn't get enough this morning. Yeah, just yeah. put policeman on a separate envelope. That's just for for us to keep him out there. We don't know how long we'll keep him out there, but uh, we just hope that they were just passing through. Amen. But uh, praise the Lord. And uh, the tapes from the uh, from Sunday morning are ready. And the uh, tapes from Thursday night, I believe there's some left. Steve was able to make them out of the videotape. We got some of those ready. And uh, remember that uh, Wednesday, let's come praying as a church. You know, the Lord has been, I don't know why it's happening this, this past two weeks, but it's like the Lord has been visiting us and visiting us every Wednesday. And, and I just pray that He keeps doing that. And whatever He wants to do in our midst, let Him do whatever He wants to do. Amen? Uh, so let's come praying. And Wednesday we'll let you know what, what time we'll meet for the picket. Uh, I was under the understanding that those people were going to move out of the that chamber. But they're not. They're wanting to buy the whole building now. But praise the Lord. We'll be right there with it. Amen. Go ahead and receive it. Uh, He's turning colors now. <laughs> Let me read this to you because this came to I me. Mean, this came to me like a <clears throat> fresh, fresh from on high when he was preaching about these garments. And I said, well, you know, sometimes we don't take these things how significant and how important this thing is. Now, we're all called to come to the dinner of God. Isn't that right? Everybody here is called of God. The Bible said, no man come to follow the Spirit of God. Draw him. You didn't call yourself. He called you. Right? Okay. Then we see here in, in uh, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and these are the words of Jesus. It's talking about the dinner guests, and starting in 11th verse, but when the king came to look over the dinner guests, he saw there, there a man not dressed now catch this, in wedding clothes. Now I want, to, I want to show you how important they're talking about God's people here. Not dressed in wedding clothes. Jesus speaking here about His Father. And He said to him, Friend, friend is a word that you use when you're talking to covenant people. He said, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In the place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then it makes a statement in the 14th verse. I think we're starting to realize this. It said, For many are called, but only a few are chosen. So we need to think about that as we continue to show up for obeying what God has said. Amen? Is the offering taken up? Let's just stand together. See, I'm just telling you, as I learned it, I don't know what was going on with me, but I started feeling a resentment about about the money. I never had anything like that. I don't even. I mean, I never had any problems with giving money, especially after what's happened to me. I started. There's something being built in me. I didn't even understand it. Almost a resentment to give money. I had not stopped giving my tithes and offerings, but I started feeling this resentment. I didn't feel this joy anymore or anything. And I didn't even know what was going on. I'm just telling you right now, before God, I mean, that was totally set free this morning on that deal. It's free. You know, see, it's not just giving. I mean, you, have, you should give with, with, with pure motives. Of, be joyful to give and obey what God said. And I, I didn't know what was going on, but I said, man, I, something, something just, I'm just totally free in that area now. I, I didn't know what, even what was going on. All I know now is I'm free of it, and I realized I, something was building inside of me. Hell never stops trying to build it. That's why we come together to be washed with the water of the Word. Amen? Let's just say this together. Dear Father, I thank you for your truth. The truth makes me free. And I just keep asking you, let the Word of God come forth. Correct me in righteousness. Establish me in righteousness. Rebuke me in righteousness. That I may be found like your Word says. Holy and blameless. I ask in Jesus' name. And I thank you. Amen. Now don't forget about the tape table and the message for this morning is already. And uh, I don't know if any other...
there's Fernando's got some tapes. I got a few tapes up here, and they, they're just for your to help you. And let me make a word of warning: don't go that way. To understand this whole subdivision, the, the bayou's overflowing and it's flooding, and you you don't want to go that way. Go go west, young man. <laughs> we dismissed three, two or three people you've never greeted before.